How are you? It's good to see you. Really looking forward to today's study. Um, today we'll be studying the book of Judges. Uh, Judges is one of those books that is, it's kind of a tough book. Um, it's pretty brutal and uh, we'll, be, we'll be getting into that a little bit. But there's an there's a area that I really want to focus on and that is the uh, uh, the why okay there's 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 a whole bunch of stuff about the what uh, happens in the book of judges but I want to kind of drill in a little bit and talk about the why um, and we'll get to that afterwards a um, couple things if you haven't yet uh, liked new life's Facebook page do that and uh, if um, I would encourage you to share these with some people uh, this one especially is, is kind of talks a little bit to why some people don't like the Bible. Uh, so anyway, we'll get into that. But let's open with prayer. And uh, please feel free to uh, ask any questions throughout the uh, the videos, the video portion. Uh, and then um, even while we're talking, you feel free to ask some questions, and I'll try to answer them if I can. And I look forward to today's study. So let's uh, let's open with prayer, shall we? Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time we could be together, Lord. God, I pray that you would illuminate our hearts today to your truth. And God, I pray that we would see how this ancient book of, of uh, consequences and uh, repentance and restoration and all that goes on in this book actually uh, is relevant to our lives today. So God, help us in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, I see that some people are logging on, so I am going to go ahead and push play on the video. So enjoy. The Book of Judges. So remember, after Joshua led the tribes of Israel into the Promised Land, he called them to be faithful to their covenant with God by obeying the commands of the Torah. And if they do this, they will show all the other nations what God is like. So Judges begins with the death of Joshua and basically tells the story of Israel's total failure. The book's name comes from the type of leaders Israel had in this period. Before they had any kings, the tribes were all governed by these judges. Now, don't think of a courtroom. These were regional political military leaders, more like a tribal chieftain. And you need to be warned, the book of Judges is very disturbing and violent. It tells the tragic tale of Israel's moral corruption, of its bad leadership, and basically how they become no different than the Canaanites. But this sad story is also meant to generate hope for the future. And you can see this in how the book's designed. There's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure as they don't drive out the remaining Canaanites. Then the large main section of the book has stories about the growing corruption of Israel's judges. And the progression here shows how Israel's leaders go from pretty good to okay to bad to worse. The concluding section is really disturbing and shows the corruption of the people of Israel as a whole. So let's dive in and we can explore each part a bit more. The opening section begins with the tribes of Israel in their territories in the Promised Land. And while Joshua defeated some key Canaanite towns, there was still a lot of land to be taken and lots of Canaanites living in those areas. And so chapter 1 gives a long list of Canaanite groups and towns that Israel just failed to drive out from the land. Now, remember, the whole point of driving out the Canaanites was to avoid their moral corruption and their way of worshiping the gods through child sacrifice. God had called Israel to be a holy people, and that does not happen. Chapter 2 describes how Israel just moved in alongside the Canaanites and adopted all their cultural and religious practices. And it's right here that the story stops. For nearly a whole chapter, the narrator gives us an overview of everything that's about to happen in the body of the book. This part of Israel's history, the narrator says, was a series of cycles moving in a downward spiral. So Israel became like the Canaanites, and so they would sin against God. So God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by the Canaanites, and eventually the Israelites would see the error of their ways and repent. So God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, from among Israel who would defeat the enemy and bring about an era of peace. But eventually Israel would sin again, and it would all start over. This cycle provides the literary design and flow for the next main section of the book. It gets repeated for each of the six main judges whose stories are told here. Now the stories of the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah, they are 
epic adventures, they're also extremely bloody stories. Either the judge themselves or people who help the judge, they defeat their enemies and deliver the people of Israel. The stories about the next three judges are longer, and they focus in on the character flaws of the judges, which get increasingly worse. So Gideon, he begins pretty well. He's a coward of a man, but he eventually comes to trust that God can save Israel through him. And so he defeats a huge army of Midianites with only 300 men carrying torches and clay pots. But Gideon has a nasty temper, and he murders a bunch of fellow Israelites for not helping him in his battle. And then it all goes downhill from there. He makes an idol from the gold that he won in his battles. And then after he dies, all Israel worships the idol as a god, and the cycle begins again. The next main judge is Jephthah, who's something of a mafia thug living up in the hills. And when things get really bad for Israel, the elders come to him begging for his help. And Jephthah was a very effective leader. He won lots of battles against the Ammonites, but he was so unfamiliar with the God of Israel, he treats him like a Canaanite God. He vows to sacrifice his daughter if he wins the battle. This tragic story, it shows just how far Israel has fallen. They no longer know the character of their own God, which leads to murder and to false worship. The last judge, Samson, is by far the worst. His life began full of promise, but he has no regard for the God of Israel. He was promiscuous, violent, and arrogant. He did win brutally strategic victories over the Philistines, but only at the expense of his own integrity, and his life ends in a violent rush of mass murder. Now, a quick note here. You'll notice a repeated theme in the main section of the book, that at key moments, God's Spirit will empower each of these judges to accomplish these great acts of deliverance. Now, the fact that God uses these really screwed up people doesn't mean he endorses all or even any of their decisions. God is committed first and foremost to saving his people, but all he has to work with is these corrupt leaders. And so work with them, he does. This whole section is designed to show just how bad things have gotten. You can't even tell the Israelites and the Canaanites apart anymore. And that's just the leaders. The final section shows Israel as a whole hitting bottom. There are two tragic stories here, and they are not for the faint of heart. They're structured by this key line that gets repeated four times at the close of the book. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The first story is about an Israelite named Micah who builds a private temple to an idol, and that gets plundered by a private army sent from the tribe of Dan. So they come and they steal everything, and then they go and burn down the peaceful city of Laish and murder all of its inhabitants. It's a horrifying story. When Israel forgets its God, might makes right. The final story of the book is even worse. It's a shocking tale of sexual abuse and violence, which all leads to Israel's first civil war. It's very disturbing. And that's the point. These stories are meant to serve as a warning. Israel's descent into self-destruction is the result of turning away from the God who loves them and saved them out of slavery in Egypt. And now Israel needs to be delivered again from themselves. The only glimmer of hope in this story is found in this repeated line in the last part of the book. It actually forms the last sentence of the story. Israel has no king. And so the stage is set for the following books to tell the origins of King David's family, the book of Ruth, and also the origins of kingship itself in Israel, the book of 1 Samuel. But the story of Judges has value as a tragedy. It's a sobering explanation of the human condition, and ultimately it points out the need for God's grace to send a king who will rescue his people. And that's the book of Judges. So, yeah, so it's a disturbing book. Um, those last few passages that they just <laughs> kind of blacked out as disturbing, yeah, they're, they're, they're rough. They're really rough. Um, and I think it's, uh, what I really want to focus in on today is um, that uh, that last section that he talked about, the very last verse is um, uh, Judges twenty one twenty five that he quotes here. And it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You know, in the very next uh, uh, place in the narrative, uh, we have this book of uh, uh, Samuel. Now, uh, there's a little bit of, so it goes, um, Judges Ruth first, because Ruth is now going to answer this uh, this question as to where this king is coming from and all that stuff. But if you go right to the next narrative uh, book, it's the book of First Samuel. And uh, if you look at that book, um, there people are asking for a king. They're asking for a king. And the question is, was that wrong? And uh, Samuel was displeased and prayed to God concerning, concerning that. He was uh, had a real hard time with that. And, and this is what God said in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7 through 8. He says this, God answered, Let all, who, all the people who are uh, saying to you... Uh, okay, so sorry. It says, uh, it says, answer, Listen to all the people who are saying to you. It is not you they are rejected. But they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up from the land of Egypt until today, Forsake me, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Um, so this concept is that um, God was always supposed to be the, the king of the, of, the, of the Israelite nation. Uh, they were not supposed to have another king. Uh, in the, back in Deuteronomy, he talks about, he prophesies that they will someday, and, and that the kings would come from the line of, uh, of Abraham, but it, is not, it was not his intent, it was not his desire, okay? Um, the request was rejecting him. They had forsaken him and were serving other gods. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, and we are living right in the center of this. Uh, we we live in a culture today that is a, um, a moral relevist uh, relevist culture. So I'm, I'm having a hard time with it, but it's really called moral rel relativism. Uh, mor moral relativism is this. I'm going to define it for you. It is a position that moral or ethical um, propositions do not reflect objective and or universal moral truths but instead make claims relative to social, cultural, historical, or personal circumstances. So we have this, uh, this idea of moral relativism in our cu cu culture where there's no, there's no basis, there's no, there's no objective basis for what's true, what's moral, what's right. And uh, this is exactly what the Israelites were doing back then. They, they, they took the cultures that they uh, lived among and they basically adopted whatever felt right to them. They did what was right in their own eyes, and they said, "This is true. This is moral. This is right." And uh, and then it just went into this cycle: sin, oppression, um, repentance, deliverance, peace. And then the cycle continued again into sin, and it went all the way around again. Uh, they see a king in this situation as uh, like the other nations that, uh, around them, that's the, that's the important quotes that we need to put in there. They see a king, like the nations around them, to be the answer, not the king that they had. So what does a king do? What, what, is, what is causing them to, to feel that this is going to answer all their problems? A king provides law and order, uh, standards of conduct, consequences for standard violations, a national figure that provides headship, a sense of identity. Leviticus 26.12 said, And I will make among you, uh, excuse, I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. See, God was already all of these things. Um, he was already all these things. He was the uh, provider of law and order. He was the standard, uh, he, he gave a standard of conduct. He, he gave consequences for standards uh, that were uh, violated. And uh, he was supposed to be this national figure, the head uh, of the house of Israel, and um, and it was he was supposed to be giving them this sense of identity. And they rejected God every time because they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And I feel that that's what we're left with today. Um, we've rejected God, and we just want to do what we want to do. We see what. Uh, the, the cultures are doing around us 
uh, and I think it's even even made its way into the church. Uh, we see what the culture is doing around us, and we want to be just like them. We want we want to uh, uh, say wrong is right and right is wrong. There's no standards for right and wrong. Uh, we even go as far as to manipulate what the Bible says to try to um, make our case, and and, uh, and it's really uh, a rejection of God as our King. Um, we have a God, a King, a Lord, yet we want to live like everyone else around us in a moral, relativistic way. John eighteen thirty seven says, uh, Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king? So this, is what, this is what we're asking here. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. Okay? And for this I have come into the world. To testify the truth, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So he's a king, and he's a bearer of truth. We have this king. Uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the king uh, and the bearer of truth. And um, it, we have to be careful that we don't just write off what he said because we feel like we want to do something else. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.15 says, uh, Which he will bring about at the proper time. He was blessed, He is who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, I want to just touch on that word Lord real quick because uh, we kind of understand king a little bit from a... a um, a geopolitical way of thinking, but Lord is kind of a uh, outdated understanding uh, of that we don't quite get anymore. So, um, Lord is a person who has authority, control, or power over others, a master, chief, or ruler. And so, when we call Jesus Lord, or we call you know, we're 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 invoking this control over our lives and. Uh, I don't even know if we're doing that. I don't know if we know, understand that that's what we're doing. We're invoking a, a level of control uh, to God. We are, are, are relinquishing control to the Lord. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is who. This is what Jesus did, and 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 I give you that verse because this is what God did for us. So we're we're looking. We're we're giving Him lordship, but we're not giving Him lordship because uh, uh, of some kind of uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, authoritative, uh, tyrannical rule. That's the word I'm looking for. Tyrannical. We're looking to the Lord who gave everything. For our well-being, and that's what the Lord was supposed to do. The Lord was supposed to take care of his of the people he was in charge of. He was in, he was in charge of their um, their well-being, their health, their food, their uh, their protection, all these things. So, um, so th we look at Romans chapter ten real quick here, uh, and it says this: For everyone, verse thirteen, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then will they call on him? Whom they have not believed. Okay, and how will they believe if the if um, of him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear unless someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So we have to be these ambassadors. We cannot give in to moral relativism. We have to say this is there is a truth. There is an objective truth. Uh, his name is Jesus. He is Lord. He is King. And uh, he has things for us that he wants us to do. Um, because he loves us. That's the, that's the thing. And we have to be that. The Israelites were not uh, dealing with sin issues. Let me just put it this way. Israel was not dealing with sin issues. Did they sin? Yes. But they were not dealing with sin issues. Sin is a natural byproduct of being born into a fallen world. They were dealing with the same things that we deal with. And that, that is a submission issue. They refused to put themselves under the kingship, the lordship, or the authority of God. Therefore, they persisted in their sin. 
And as soon as they, you know, God, God rescued them, sent judges, rescued them, and they had a relative peace, they did it again because they have a submission issue. Sin is something that we all struggle with. Uh, we sin. What we, uh, what sin is really a byproduct of is a submission issue, a pride issue. Uh, Romans 8, I'm sorry, um, yeah, Romans 8 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made us free from the law of sin and death. We live in an age where we don't have to be slaves to sin any longer. We, we can uh, submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and then therefore be set free from that sin. Um, does God just save us from sin? No, He doesn't. God doesn't just save us from sin. By His Holy Spirit, He empowers us to be more than conquerors. He gives us the power to destroy the selfish pride that fights against the sovereignty of God. He gives us the power to surrender to the God who loves us. That's what He gives us the power to do. Romans 6, sin must no longer rule in your mortal bodies so that you obey the desires of your natural self. Nor must you surrender any part of yourselves to sin to be useful for wicked purposes. Instead, give yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and surrender your whole being to Him to be useful for righteousness purposes. For righteous purposes. Sin must not be your master. For you do not live under the law, but under God's grace. You live under God's grace. Romans six twenty three. The sin uh, for sin pays its wages, death. But God's free gift is eternal life, in union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's that's what they didn't get, and I think there might be a connection um, between them not being able to get it um, and them lacking the power to do it. Uh, we live in an age now where we, we are supposed to be living in the power of the Holy Spirit so that sin has no dominion over us. Sin has no dominion over us. Um, yet I think we still have the same issues, even in our churches, we have the same issues that they had back then. And it's not a sin issue. I'm telling you again, it's not a sin issue. We are um, we are born into a sinful condition. We have a submission issue. We have a, we have a surrender issue. And um, if we can surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, um, then we will have, uh, the more and more we do that, the more and more our own sinful pride, our own selfish desires, we have to fight against it. Um, will be uh, manifest in our in our in our bodies. Um, the more we surrender, you know, like John said, less of me and more of him. The more we do this, um, the more we uh, will be in line with what Jesus has us doing. And uh, we'll, we'll we'll be talking a little bit about this more on Sunday uh, in our our service our sermon on uh, courage. Uh, but I just uh, I want to encourage you that. Uh, the Israelites had a king. And if they had obeyed their king, they would have been fine. Um, but they wanted what everybody else had. How about you? Do you have a king? Do you have a lord? Do you have a standard for what's uh, moral and what's right and wrong? Um, you do if you choose to acknowledge him. It's uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, and uh, he makes it very clear that he is the one, and, he, and he's deserving. And he, here's the deal. He's deserving. Just as uh, God in the Old Testament constantly talked about how he was deserving of Israel's uh, devotion because it brought him out of Egypt uh, and put him in a place where they, uh, that they didn't really deserve. So we have been brought out of bondage of sin by the sacrifice of Christ and brought to a place we don't deserve. And uh, that's the God who loves us. And he's worthy of our uh, submission, our surrender. So let me pray with you. God, thank you for this day. I thank you for this study. God, I pray that we would not fall into the same trap that so many do and live this life of moral relativism. 
but that we would be a people who, um, who surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because you are so worthy, you've taken us out of uh, bondage, out of slavery, to sin, and you've given us a, a place that we don't deserve, a standing of sonship and daughter, uh, daughtership in the kingdom of God. We don't deserve it, but you gave it to us. You brought us out, and you, uh, you are our Lord. So God, help us to be submissive and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our every day, to lay, uh, to pick up our cross and to follow you daily. And uh, we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go. Serve the King. Have a great day. God bless.